more than perhaps in any city in the world, um, Barcelona has been a leader in thinking about how you integrate uh, technology and urbanism. And this goes all the way back to the birth of modern Barcelona in the 1850s, um, when Ildefon Cerda released his plan for the expansion of, of Barcelona. Um, and today, you know, companies like Cisco Systems like to talk about the internet as the fourth utility, right? Um, well, Cerda in the 1850s saw the telegraph as the fourth utility, and his plan actually called for conduit for the telegraph, which was sort of the network technology of the day. So it's great to be here. Um, and what I'm going to present to you is not um, the book, but actually um, a study that I did three years ago now for the Rockefeller Foundation uh, that actually planted the seed for the book. Um, and there's a whole chapter that talks about um, the need for inclusion, and it's really just a theme that works its way through. Um, and this forecast that we did for Rockefeller was called uh, A Planet of Civic Laboratories, The Future of Cities, Information, and Inclusion. And I think it was really the first look um, at this new smart cities movement, which I think is about five years old, um, really started in 2008 uh, during the financial crisis when big corporations started looking to cities for new markets. And it was really the first look um, to take into account you know, the unique needs of the poor. Now, there was some um, talk earlier about the need to standardize across cities and the idea that cities all have the same problems. I think that's true to a limited extent, um, but cities also need to craft uh, their solutions using their local tools, their people, their assets, their institutions, within a set of constraints which can often be very, very unique. And so this notion of a civic laboratory is a place where essentially what's a globally standard technology, the internet, mobile phones, um, you know, different kinds of, of computer languages are adapted to meet those local needs. Um, and, you know, if you try to tally up the numbers of several people have, there's something on the order of uh, 500 to 600,000 local governments around the world. And so each of them is using this, these technologies to address their own problems. And so there's just this tremendous flowering of innovation going on. Um, but if you look at, at some of the dominant narratives that have um, been told, uh, and the visions of cities of the future th you know, that you see in IBM marketing materials, these, these claims that buildings are going to bring down their own energy costs, drivers are going to see traffic jams before they happen. They're essentially saying if you buy a piece of software and install it in your city, it will fix all of your problems, and no one will have to do anything. No one, citizens won't have to make different decisions. And you know, as I looked at this, I found this really um, bankrupt in a lot of ways because um, the technology industry, all the, the, the things that have changed our lives as citizens and consumers, from smartphones to the internet to personal computers, um, these were all things that were built um, by people who challenged that point of view, people who challenged the idea that you know, there only needed to be 10 computers in the world, um, like the People's Computer Club uh, in Palo Alto in the 70s, or the Homebrew Computer Club, which was founded at the same time where Steve Jobs and um, uh, Steve Wozniak demoed the Apple One. And this was a very um, influential movement to democratize information technology. And I found that was missing um, you know, in these uh, contemporary visions of smart cities. And then if you look at the history of urbanism itself, there's always been this tension between top-down planning and, and sort of more organic growth of cities, uh, more grassroots-driven agendas, played out in my city in New York between these two people, Robert Moses on the left, who tried to modernize New York and, and plow highways through neighborhoods, vibrant neighborhoods, and Jane Jacobs, a noted urbanist and writer who at the time uh, was a housewife who um, mobilized community support to fight Moses and actually won, um, and in the process kind of emasculated the whole practice of urban planning in the United States for many, many years. And so I've always been curious, like, were these kinds of uh, these kinds of battles playing out um, in smart cities as well. And so the challenge um, from Rockefeller, and I think this is a challenge that the World Bank has taken up with, with vigor, is how do you harness data uh, for economic development in poor parts of the world and to do it in a way that's inclusive? And, and not just inclusive, but also fighting uh, the risks of greater exclusion, which as we'll see often arise in these systems. And I think um, where I've come to, you know, as I've, as I've did the research for the book and talked to people in industry, talked to, to grassroots innovators and developers, talked to people in government at various levels, was that it's not actually a battle over the smart city. And in many ways, the, the corporations and the hackers at the grassroots aren't even talking to each other. They don't even really know each other exist. It's the civic leaders in the middle who are the ones that are listening to citizens, identifying their problems, and then communicating to both, both of those players, this is how you should build technology 
and work together to create solutions for us. And um, so what we produced um, you know, from all this research uh, in 2010 was a, a graphic forecast map that basically laid out um, a set of what we call solution templates. And these are, these are what these different colored bubbles are. They're sort of strategies, combinations of technology, um, user behavior, business models, uh, governance reforms that um, we think could empower more inclusive smart city visions. Um, and they're broken down into four sets of strategies. There's commons-based strategies, which we've heard lots about, crowdsourcing, um, uh, open data, uh, making data visible, market-based solutions. Um, there's lots of really interesting things going on in uh, interfaces for people who are disabled, people who can't read, um, people who um, uh, you know, may not have access to a, a network all of the time. It's this idea of pro-poor interfaces. Um, design and planning is another area where obviously cities have to be designed and planned. Um, and there's, there's many new tools coming online um, that are allowing more participatory planning, more effective planning, uh, allowing you to think about long-term issues using real-time live data, which changes the way you do that. And then this idea of on-demand resilience, you know, how do you build capacity to respond not knowing what the actual disaster is going to be or when it's going to come. And then, of course, governance. Um, my favorite in the governance category is what I call continuous counting. And you look at things like the UN Global Pulse Project. Um, we're going from a world where you know, we basically did a socioeconomic survey once a decade through a census, and now we're doing it basically moment by moment using exhaust data from business and government. And so that's sort of the, the positive side of this forecast. There's just a tremendous opportunity um, to leverage technology to, to help the poor. Um, but there's also a lot of risks, uh, not just in, in um, the deployment of smart city solutions generally, unintended consequences, but sometimes putting a system in place actually um, has the opposite effect of, of what you intended. You may actually make things worse. And so in, in the map, we also positioned uh, six dilemmas around inclusive technology that I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, briefly. Um, okay, so you can't really see these because they're superimposed, but the first one uh, is around what we called um, uh, the battle for the smart city, so market growth versus inclusive planning. You know, the private sector wants to invest a lot of money in urban solutions right now. This is the whole excitement around public-private partnerships, right? There is capital available to solve urban problems, but in the rush to, to exploit that opportunity, how do we slow down enough to make sure that the right people are included and, and that all the stakeholders in the city are included and it's not just company or not just the company and government? Uh, a second dilemma is around um, just the explosion of data. Okay, so visible data versus actionable data. I think that there's a huge institutional crisis looming um, in urban government, in urban planning, uh, over the, the, the volume of data that's coming at public managers, at planners, at decision makers and the much slower rate of development of good tools to analyze and understand that data. And so you potentially have a situation where you may have leaders not making better decisions because of big data, but being overwhelmed by it, possibly turning away from it, and resorting just back to their hunches. And that's, that's a terrible situation, and it, needs to be, it will need to be managed going forward. I'm doing a big forecast right now that's looking at how big data is impacting transportation planning and what will the field of transportation planning look like 20 years from now. I don't think they'll be doing the same thing because be, the challenge will be managing the data um, in, a, in a very agile way. Uh, so the idea of proliferating digital divides, um, access versus agency. Um, I think most policymakers have a very, very limited binary view of what access to IT and access to digital services, access to e-government means. They think you're either connected or you're not. And in fact, as the, we as the, the internet and computing now moves off of the desktop um, into our pockets, embedded in the, in the buildings and the infrastructure around us, the digital divide is getting a lot more complicated, not a lot simpler. And so you see a lot of governments patting themselves on the back and saying, hey, yeah, you know, we have 100% internet access. We'll do 100% of your citizens know how to find a job using a search engine? Do they know how to get accesses to the e-government services? You know, is it, is it, are they digitally literate? And so um, this idea of access versus agency, very, very important. Um, uh, so uh, participatory public services. Um, lots of excitement about crowdsourcing uh, solutions to urban problems. But if you look at it from a slightly different point of view, 
Um, crowdsourcing is the equivalent of gated communities. People who don't have um, the spare time, don't have spare funds, don't know how to participate in those schemes, may get left out because you may see governments basically saying, um, all right, well, there's a crowdsource solution to that problem. We can either withdraw our role or we may have never actually provided that and now we can kind of wash our hands of it going into the future. So the idea of cooperation versus offloading public respo uh, responsibilities. Um, uh, data control. So we know that a lot of the data that's being generated in the smart city has tremendous value to governments in terms of planning and that there's tremendous public good that can be uh, derived from that. So um, IBM just did this amazing project in Istanbul where they took a month's uh, mobile phone records, location data, and something like a billion pieces of data and completely redesigned the whole bus network. I mean, this is, this is basically taking the same kind of data that, that the National Security Agency wants to track, uh, you know, to track people and using it for great public good. Um, and obviously, there's tremendous uh, privacy implications around that. So how do you manage the balance between creating safeguards but also exploiting data for the public good? And the reason we call these dilemmas is because they're not going to get solved anytime soon. The development of the smart city, um, new solutions, is going to make these problems more and more um, uh, of an issue going forward. And we don't see any easy solutions on either side of any of these. And then the final one is just this fundamental question of an economic gap versus a knowledge gap. So is, is the idea of an inclusive smart city about uh, you know, people who have resources coming in and intervening to bring uh, the developing world, to bring uh, uh, historically excluded communities up to the level of the rest of the world? Or is it to empower them to sort of chart their own path forward and to develop the resources that may already be there? And there are tremendous resources in poor communities. Um, and I love the framework that Richard Heeks uses um, when he talks about the use of IT for development. He's a scholar at the University of Manchester. And he talks about um, pro-poor, uh, pro para-poor, and per-poor uh, development. And pro-poor is um, sort of you know, dropping in with aid and saying, here you go. Uh, you know, enjoy. Um, Parapur is wading in and, and co-creating these solutions with um, the communities that you're trying to serve. And we're certainly seeing a big shift towards that all around the world. But Parapur is sort of what he sees as the ideal, uh, which is that poor communities take technology from the marketplace or the commons and use it entirely on their own to craft their own solutions. And I think, um, you know, in an ideal world, that's where we're headed. And, you know, in the Soetos and Caberas and Rocinhas of the world, you'll see poor communities crafting their own solutions uh, with these increasingly democratized technologies. So please pick up the book. I'd I'm going to be around uh, tomorrow at City Sense and uh, the next two days, and I would love to have conversations with all of you uh, about these topics. Thank you.